Hey guys, what's up? Uh, I just really needed a change of scenery. Uh, the movie room's also very cold, so this I feel like excuse king here for everything. And uh, it's just like all the stuff I was talking about recently, like, oh, I have all these health problems and everything. And they weren't, I, I don't know how serious they actually are. I don't think they're that serious. But on top of that, so I have COVID. That's great, right? So uh, yeah, I tested positive for COVID on Tuesday night. It is now Friday. I still feel pretty under the weather. Had to take some days off working out and everything. Been watching movies, kind of things like that on everything. So I, I could still do my weekly review and everything like that. Uh, the show must go on and everything like that. Still a lot of stuff is up in the air with my life, but let's talk some movies. Hopefully my brain fog is not too strong this week. So first up is from Cauldron Films. This is kind of their other sub-label, Neon Eagle Video. I know they have a second release coming. I think it is, or was it uh, Frankenstein 80? Possibly was a Cauldron, I can't remember. But uh, this is Kill Butterfly Kill. And this is a very strange kind of film history on here. The history of the film is probably more interesting than the movie itself. So there's three cuts of the movie on here. The first cut is Underground Wife, which was originally released in 1982 at 85 minutes. And then they went ahead and re-released it a few years later um, as Kill Butterfly Kill. And then they went ahead and released it in 87 and did a whole bunch of reshoots and patched them in there as American Commando 6, Kill Butterfly Kill. So let's, I guess, start with the main version, which I would say is the 89 minute version. So when you're watching this, you'll realize that there's gonna be different qualities here. There's two Blu-rays in here. The first cut is just basically kind of a VHS kind of deal. Um, that is The Underground Wife, it is the shortest cut of the bunch. And this one, it, it's basically just the same movie as uh, Kill Butterfly Kill with less seats. This is the original, uh, you know, Taiwanese, I believe it is, or Hong Kong version. And then they went ahead and re-released it in 80, and like a few years later, uh, 84, 85, with more footage in there and everything like that. So this is kind of a bizarre rape revenge film, kind of really weird. So essentially what we have here is this woman who is kind of attacked by this group of thugs in the very beginning. She's like running through this rainy day. Sorry about that. Running through this rainy railroad tracks and everything like that. And then what happens is she is taken advantage of. And they kind of like, they don't show she's raped, but they don't show all the details. We kind of fast forward and we're kind of introduced to this kind of hitman kind of guy. And he's hired by this thug who's in a slew of movies. You've seen him. This thug hires him to take out some people and he does it. But he doesn't complete the job. So this guy kind of holds it over his head, doesn't pay him fully, upsets him greatly. Um, this kind of woman who was taken advantage of is now working as a prostitute, and runs into this guy and kind of knows the history, starts to talk to him and realizes that they have some common enemies. They kind of team up and decide to take out this crime boss. Uh, this guy kind of has a thing for her and he decides to help her take out all the rapists. So every time we learn who the rapists are, we have this big flashback and we see their rape scene that took place. It's so weird because each, each rape scene is almost like a weird fetish thing. The movie doesn't really have any nudity. So, but what it does have is a lot of sleaze and like the, the rape scenes go to this flashback and some involve like eels and like whipping and alcohol. It's like, they're almost like becoming more fetishized as they go on and you're just like so weird. All the group of guys are really weird and bizarre and they all have different lives and everything. It's kind of reminds me of Basket Case, right? That all these, that Basket Case is picking off all these people and everything like that. This time they're all like different walks of life. Uh, of course, you know, it all kind of goes to this giant climax and everything like that, a big standoff with villains. There's a lot of action in here. Um, the dubbing is pretty ridiculous. It's over-the-top insane. Uh, it never lets down on the action. There's some goofiness, some unintentional humor. Overall, it's a pretty solid kind of uh, like revenge kind of uh, action film if, and exploitation style deal. I enjoyed it for the most part. Uh, I, I would basically just skim through the original version to see what you're missing and watch the 89-minute version as Kill Butterfly Kill. That's the remastered version. Version. It looks pretty good for what it is, obviously. I mean, these movies weren't always the best taken care of. And then we kind of go to the second disc here, American Commando 6. Um, and this is so weird. This is really rough. Especially, It's very interesting at the point that you can watch the original version and then watch this version and see how they kind of incorporated the new scenes and edited in the old scenes, how you can tell that characters are not in the same room or anything like that. So we kind of add, enter, like, add in this element of this like white like Italian kind of crime boss that they want to take out. And there's this guy in 
hired to do it. And he starts to use these these assassins from the first movie to help him. So it's all spliced in. There's like an elaborate chase scene of a pickpocket. And for the most part, there's a lot more shooting and, and squibs and all this kind of stuff. Overall, it's really hokey, really silly. And it definitely feels like, you know how like if you compare Men Behind the Sun 1 to 2 and 3, and 2 and 3 are just really wonky and goofy? It's like that. Like the first movie is kind of serious, although a little goofy. Um, but these, this one is just absolutely absurd. It's kind of a cut and paste, weird nonsense. I think a lot of unintentional humor. People will love this as like a midnight movie for sure. And again, it's interesting to see how they kind of save these kind of weird movies, how they patch them together and everything like that. And like, you ever watched a movie, you're like, why are these people not even in the same room? What is happening here? And a lot of times it's something like America Commando 6. I mean, I ain't even seen the first five though. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, these movies are just probably a very loose kind of series that they just sold with the title American Commando. I'm not even sure if any of them are related, to be honest. So as far as special features are concerned, we have audio commentary by Kenneth Morrison and Paul Fox of the podcast of Fire Network. We have, of course, the Underground Wife cut. That's an SD. And the American Commando, we have just that in HD. Um, so yeah, there's one commentary for the 87-minute version of the uh, original film. And then we also have both versions on here. Uh, the bad guy are cool in this as well it's memorable uh they're they're really sleazy and you recognize a lot of the character actors from these movies of course but if it sounds like it's up your alley if you like these revenge kind of asian films then i would recommend kill butterfly kill you could do a lot worse i enjoyed it myself Okay, next up we have a 4K from Arrow Video, and this is a doozy. This is from 1996, and this is Tremors Part 2. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of the first one. I think most people are a huge fan of the first Tremors film, kind of a, a cult phenomenon. And I remember when this one came out in 96. Now, the first Tremors wasn't gangbusters on uh, you know theatrical release, but it really made a steady kind of cult, it made a steady cult following on uh, the rental stores. I, it was a PG-13 movie, I think, that a lot of monster kids found it. A lot of people just found its humor and buddy comedy elements and western kind of feel as a, as a monster movie kind of reflecting those 50s kind of desert horror sci-fi movies of the times and Tremors kind of became this this kind of like masterpiece under underground masterpiece deal had a great cast and Kevin Bacon Fred Ward Reba McIntyre Michael Gross and of course it was inevitable that a sequel would come you know after a few years of being on VHS and making a lot of money in the video stores they made this sequel in 96 they had to kind of change some of the facts around they couldn't get everybody and listening to the commentaries of the the filmmakers and everything they talk about having to change the script around when they couldn't get Kevin Bacon when they couldn't get Reba McIntyre but who they did get was they got Fred Ward and they also got Michael Gross to come back so that's nice to see two of the three kind of like tremor killers back I mean there's more people obviously involved with the film but uh, I think that the, there's kind of a heavy group of people Michael Gro uh, that uh, people kind of associate with tremors and Fred Ward is definitely one of them so is Michael Gross Michael Gross be kind of the face of the series if you will and Burt Gummer is just a hilarious kind of survivalist kind of guy everybody loves him so uh, this time time around uh, Fred Ward is kind of living uh, you know basically his best kind of you know odd job kind of life uh, odd, odd jobs kind of life and he is approached by uh, this this kind of Mexican uh, oil kind of group that they say you know basically these graboids are killing our workers and attacking our oil refinery well we want to pay you a crap load of money to get rid of them and uh, some, some super fan that knows the story approaches him as well. And he's kind of the stand-in for Kevin Bacon. To be honest, nothing personal against the actor, but it's really hard to replace Kevin Bacon. He doesn't quite have the chemistry that Bacon and him have. And the more he tries, the more it seems forced, the more it seems like a comic book cartoon, which is not bad, but it just feels a little totally off with the first one. The first one does have a sense of fun to it, but this almost seems like a sense of like trying too hard, almost like um, fanfare too much or whatever. I don't know. It just doesn't necessarily work. It's really hard to make it work. But he's really kind of just the weakest character. Not a horrible actor. Just that never works. Even as like Jamie Kennedy in part five, never worked for me. Just forced. They have that kind of deal. So at first, uh, they kind of doing the old things with the graphoids, blowing them up, and everything's going planned. But then they kind of evolve. And we learned that the Graboids have this kind of next step in evolutionary fun. So it's a sequel. It's going to be bigger with the monsters. It's going to be more bloody, all that kind of deal. Now the kill count's not as high. I don't think the graphic violence towards humans is necessarily on the level. There are some kills here and there, but I do think that the monster mayhem is up there. Um, I think the first Tremors is vastly superior. I know a lot of people like this one as well, as I do. I think it's good. I think it's fun. Like I said, the first one is one of my all-time favorites. This one is good. And rewatching it was nice to see, especially coming out in 1996. I mean, the last landscape of horror and sci-fi and stuff was really different in the 90s, especially after Scream. So in 96, we have Scream, we have Ebola Syndrome, we have From Dusk Till Dawn, we have The Craft. We have a really weird year. There's not quite anything else like Tremors. 
you know, so Tremors 2 coming out that year was a breath of fresh air. I mean, very excited when this came out. Uh, Burt Gummer kind of finds his own on this, and he, he plays into the character more, but for him it works, you see? Him being that little bit of over-the-topness works really well. He's very funny, he has a lot of quotable lines, and he kind of starts to become the face of the franchise, right? I mean, who's who's the best character to go against uh, the Grab Boys? It's a survivalist guy, a single survivalist. He's very funny. He's got a lot of good lines in here. It's the first time I'm out of ammunition in my entire life, all that kind of deals. He, he just argues. There's a lot of fun this, and this movie is pretty action-packed. I mean, there's no real downtime. Right from the beginning, the Grab Boys are there. It's kind of a uh, pick them off, and then it kind of goes back to the original where they're kind of surviving and hiding and all these kind of things. Um, and it does change the uh, game a little bit. You know, you won't want to see the exact same movie over and over again. But uh, yeah, it pays off. I, I think Trevor's 2 is a, is a worthy sequel, to be honest. And uh, as far as the special features are concerned, they're pretty solid. We have two commentaries on here, one of which with the filmmakers, which I enjoyed. Uh, the other one is kind of a fan, and that one was okay. I didn't get to listen to the whole thing. The filmmakers one I enjoyed more because they're kind of putting in the script elements and why they change certain things and the budget changes, and that's all interesting to me. Nothing against the other commentary. I think that they do repeat themselves a little bit, so I feel like you can choose one or the other and probably get similar kind of things from it. Um, um, and there's other features as well that I checked out. Of course, um, we also have, what are the other ones? I want to make sure. Um, yeah, Graboid, Go Boom, an early film interview with special effects designer Peter Chisney. Critical need to know information, early film interview with CG supervisor Phil Tibbet. That was also nice. Phil Tibbet obviously is kind of a little bit more known than now. And that's great because he directed Mad God as well as worked on tons of big movies. Um, and then we also have The Making of Tremors 2. That's a, a out archive, outtakes, all that kind of stuff like that. And then we have a booklet as well, a massive booklet, really cool stuff. Um, it looks great in 4K. It sounds great. I mean, there's a lot of explosions and actions in the action in this one. So uh, Tremors 2 is well worth your time. I, I thought that was a very nice release. Uh, it runs 100 minutes, which is kind of a long for a monster movie. But you know what? It's paced pretty well. There's a lot of action throughout the entire movie. And it gets started right away. So Tremors 2, a great release from Arrow Video. Um, you know what? I, I never really loved the third one. So if they put it out, I'll definitely check it out and give that one another spin. And I'll Believe it or not, I ever watched part four. I'm, I always kind of get burned out on franchises. I've seen part five, but not four. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Uh, when we started getting into the late 90s, early 2000s, any franchise films kind of deterred me, especially when they were made in the 80s, 90s, or something like that. It just, I just lost interest in them. Um, so, yeah. But Tremors 2, really enjoyed it then. Still enjoy it now. Okay, the next one up is a double feature from 88 Films. We're going to start with the first one, and that is Long Arm of the Law Part 1. This has both versions, of course. Um, so the first one here is made in 1984, if I can get it out of the cover here. I don't you always love that? They always put them really nice in there and impossible to get out here. But Long Arm of the Law, 84, directed by, is it, uh, is it Mock? I, I can't remember. Johnny Mac, Mac or Mock, uh, and uh, his brother does the sequel, so that's why I remember that. But uh, yeah, Long Arm of the Law. So this one, I had not really heard much about. There's a series of four films, but I'll say this right now. I really enjoyed this one. So essentially what we have here is a group of about half a dozen uh, Chinese criminals that are in the Big Circle Gang, a very loyal gang, and they're very close-knit and everything like that. So essentially their plan is to sneak into Hong Kong, commit a very high you know, uh, reward jewelry uh, theft, and then kind of jump back to China and have their riches. They, you meet all the characters and everything like that, and a really kind of good moment where they're all taking their fake identification pictures. You have like Bullseye and Rooster and Chung. You get to learn who all the characters are. They definitely spend their time creating these characters and showing their kind of like connection with each other. So at first they kind of have to escape into Hong Kong and there's this really intense scene that's really brutal and somebody actually does uh, kind of bite it there and it's, it's really messed up and it kind of shows that they actually do genuinely care about each other. What makes them different? And they kind of beat this over the heads is that Chinese people or Chinese gangs, they have a sense of loyalty that the Western world, Hong Kong, doesn't have. And uh, that's why they're they're stronger. That's why they're harder to defeat. That kind of idea, right? That one, one for all kind of deal. So they kind of go into this area and um, there's a, a connection there that they're supposed to meet that's supposed to set up the jewelry heist and everything. And they do him a favor that backfires in their face. And somebody dies that shouldn't die. Somebody they kill that they shouldn't kill. And a really graphic scene. This movie likes to shoot people in the face. And it shows it in graphic detail. And the death scene here is intense. It's really kind of high stunt filled. And just a lot of really uh, immaculate kind of work and everything. Cinematography. How it's done is really good. 
So this kind of paints them in the number one like kind of spotlight here. Uh, now they have also uh, gangs after them. They have the police after them and everything like that. And they're out for some revenge. They're out for a vendetta, but they still want to pull this heist off. So what happens is uh, the movie kind of builds up these characters, forming relationships with people in Hong Kong. One of them has a longtime girlfriend that's worked as a prostitute now. One of them is kind of dating a girl. So they all have these connections and everything like that. And you learn who they are. Uh, one is uh, definitely a country bumpkin and rooster, is that they call him, uh, one of the, the prostitutes. And he's, he's pretty much an overall idiot. But uh, as it goes on, um, we kind of get to this very end film uh, scene. And I kept, caught a pattern in both the Long Arm of the Law films where they build up to these immaculate, insane, giant climaxes. And the first one it has some of the best shootout stuff I've ever seen. It takes place in the back alleys of the Hong Kong apartments and neighborhoods, kind of how they keep going higher and higher. And there's concrete barriers and these alleys and all this kind of stuff. And this is elaborate shootout of intensity and at, at times betrayal and then a loyalty all coming together in a highly emotional, highly action packed moment. And it's a great shootout. The squibs are great. The action is great. Everything about this end shootout is top notch. It really brought the movie up a level. It's a good crime drama. But then after that, you're just like, wow, that's very impressive. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. And I thought it was a really good stuff. Uh, as far as the special features are concerned, we of course have um, stunning new 2K restoration. Looks great. Uh, the Hong Kong version, we also have the export cut, English dub. Audio commentary with uh, Frank Jin, who's great. Family business interview with Michael Bach. Fam uh, from Hong Kong to police to big circle gangs. An interview with scriptwriter Philip Chan. A conversation with action director Billy Chan. Scriptwriter Philip Chan. An interview with Johnny Mock. A theatrical trailer. This is AB locked. So yeah, this is great stuff anyways. Long arm of the law. Highly recommended. We're going to dive into the sequel here, Long Arm of the Law Saga, Saga 2. Now, this is not a direct sequel, although some of the people may pop up, some of the same actors and everything like that. Instead of following you know, criminals, we're actually going to follow a group of people that are criminals that get turned to be police informants. They were once cops, turned criminals, now back to cops. So essentially, they have to go undercover in this gang, this big circle gang, um, and they have to kind of infiltrate and turn over evidence for two years to get their kind of citizenship in Hong Kong. That's basically the plot of Long Arm of the Law Part 2. And at first, these three guys, there's three of them, one of which the lead is in a million movies. You've seen him in a lot of like, uh, you know, kind of fantasy horror erotic stuff is what I recognize him from. He's very good. And he's a very tall man. Uh, you'd recognize him right away. I'm not too super familiar with actors' names in a lot of these, which I apologize for. Um, it, it's kind of like learning character actors as you go on, right? I, I, I took a long time as a kid to learn basically American character actors, then uh, Italians as I got older, and now it's kind of like learning a lot of the Hong Kong character actors and everything like that. Um, and it's harder with old age, I'll tell you that. But uh, as this one goes on, you kind of learn that these guys are infiltrating this gang and they have a, 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 a kind of connection. And at first this connection is really shaky, but they kind of prove themselves to this guy and in a really excellent way. And after that, their loyalty grows. So it becomes kind of a group of four. And as they uh, kind of get figured out, there's this amazing scene where they kind of have to uh, defend themselves at times. It's, it's kind of like not always action, but when the action's there, it's very kind of very in your face and just very fast and intense, you know, not much room for mistakes. People get shot in the arm and they survive, but then you get shot five or six times. It's, it's brutal. It's a lot of people getting shot when they, and multiple times and everything like that. And the film obviously is going to build up to this amazing climax where these characters, again, the source is all about loyalty. Live together, die together. You know, you, you take that stand and you live by it. You know, it's, it's kind of like when you side with a man, you stay with them. If you can't do that, you're some kind of animal from the wild bunch, right? It's kind of like that in a way too, right? Um, so, so it has these elements. And these movies do remind me of stuff like Westerns or Young Guns or Wild Bunch and that kind of deal, right? Where you have a group of people like this and they're not perfect and they make a lot of mistakes and they probably are villains in a lot of ways. But yet you're watching them and you're kind of siding with them at the same time. But uh, Long Arm of the Lost uh, Saga 2 is really good. Again, it makes up for the ending. And it ends with this like beautifully sad love song, which I was like, I don't, that makes me very depressed. But yeah, I, I really like this one as well. Great lead performance and the action here. There's a scene in an airport where a character is running and doing all these stunts. Like good luck catching that guy, man. He is so good. So fast. Great stunts. Um, it's, I, I love gunplay. I love Hong Kong, like Kung Fu movies, but the gunplay stuff like John Woo and all these movies, it's just, I, I really kind of gravitate towards that and their horror movies a little bit more than the Kung Fu. I do like Kung Fu, but I tend to like action and more like gunplay and horror over that. 
As far as the special features, of course, we have a commentary by Frank Jin again. Great stuff. Bringing the action interview with director Michael Mock, a man of action to interview with the co star Ben Lame. On offer, you can't refuse. Interview with scriptwriter Philip Chan. The Iron Fist of Crime interview with uh, stuntman Stephen Chan. So, yeah, again, AB locked, 88 films. These are both Golden Harvest movies, so you know you're getting quality. Really recommend this one if you guys have not seen it. Long Arm of the Law Saga 2. I hope they release three and four. I don't know much about them. I hope they're good stuff. Okay, the next one up is from Mondo Macabro, and it's from everybody's favorite director, Jess Franco. And this makes me realize that I've probably seen more movies than any director um, as Jess Franco. I've seen at least 35 movies by Jess Franco. And I know people ask, nothing. Jess Franco directed 200. But 35 is a lot, okay? Um, so the, the, uh, the Sinister, Dr. Orloff. Now, this is the last in the Orloff series. Now, Dr. Orloff, the original, is made in like 63, the awful Dr. Orloff. It's a pretty good film starring Howard Vernon. In, and it's basically you know this kind of deal where he uses this kind of this kind of big struck a guy with these things to carry out his crimes and everything like that experiments you know kind of in a vein of eyes without a face uh, later dr fives would kind of do the similar thing so what we have here is a sinister dr orloff from 1984 i think originally made in the early 80s and this stars of course howard vernon in a smaller role and it also stars um antonio mayans who is a huge jess franco regular he's in I don't know who's in more Jess Franco movies, Lena Rome, Howard Vernon, or Antonio Mayans. Maybe Antonio Mayans has got a beat, right? I mean, there's other guys like Paul Mueller and Jack Taylor, and, and of course, you know, Soledad Miranda. But, you know, I, I don't think anybody beats Antonio Mayans. So uh, any, anyways, what we have here is we kind of follow Orloff's son. And, and as the commentary points out, Troy Haworth and, and everything like that, and uh, Nathaniel Thompson, and I think there's a Stephen Thrower on here too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, interview with Stephen Thrower. They're all talking about like how it's like, this must not be the same Orloff because it would make him like certain amount of age, like 800 years and it's different time pieces. It's just like the whole family of Orloff is into weird medical shit. But essentially the plot is a remake of the original, right? He's trying to resurrect his dead wife, but instead of him doing it, his son is taking over. And his son has invented some sort of weird teleportation device where you can teleport bodies certain places and they're dead. I don't know. I really don't know. This one is a little, it's not Franco's best. It's not his worst. It's full of nudity. And they say as much in the commentary, it's not Franco's best. It's not his worst. There's still enough to take away from it. And that's Troy Haworth. And I would agree. But I, I don't have that much to say about it. What I will say is essentially it is a remake of the original Orloff. Not as good. It's not a black and white. Cinematography is not as good. Acting is not as good. I mean, not that it's poor, but you really don't get as much Howard Vernon. Howard Vernon is kind of kind of pushed to the background here while Antonio Mayans is kind of a lead front. Essentially what we have here is a lot of these scenes where a woman is tortured and held down and then just kind of nude, naked, and these weird whips and everything like that. Super gratuitous nudity, a lot of women being carried away, absolutely naked, completely naked. And that's the majority of the movie. So if you're looking for full frontal nudity and, and kind of a lot of sexual stuff, then you're, it, it's good for you. If you're looking for hardcore gore or amazing special effects, then this is not for you. If you're looking for solid scenery and background, this is probably for you. But if you're looking for this kind of knock your socks off gore fest or something like that, this is probably one of the worst Franco movies for you. It's just filled with nudity. And that's about all it has going for it. Maybe some interesting medical concepts, you know, uh, scientific kind of deals. But it, it's kind of all hogwash in that aspect as well. Um, you know, it, it's not a particularly memorable movie, to be honest. It looks great. I mean, it looks amazing. They remastered this thing. It looks great. The locations are good, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of good technical stuff for how cheap the movie is. But besides that, the script is just not really a complete idea, not a complete script. It was the last uh, Orloff movie. Um, and it ends on a great note of Howard Vernon just laughing hysterically. I don't know if he's laughing at us for watching it, laughing at his son for screwing up, laughing at the evil plan that finally comes to fruition. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, worth watching if you're a Franco uh, completist um, it, or, you know, Orloff completist. Uh, it's not the worst Orloff movie I've seen, I'll tell you that. Uh, that uh, that's got to go to the 1971. I can't remember. Is it The Invisible Man? I'm not even sure if that's a real Orloff movie, right? But uh, so what we have here on the special features is, of course, a brand new 4K transfer, uh, interview with Antonio Mayans, interview with Stephen Thrower, our new commentary from Troy Haworth and Nathaniel Thompson. I, I enjoyed the commentary and the interview with Stephen Thrower. Um, they kind of put context to this and everything like that. Good stuff. Uh, anyways, it's not the best Franco. It's not the worst Franco. Right down the middle on it. Would I watch it again? Possibly. Would I love it? Probably not. Would I like it? Maybe. So it's Doctor the Sinister Dr. Orloff. Check it out if you like it. Orloff movies. All right. Now it's time to get in those 1981 movies. Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell. 
because through that gateway, evil will invade the world. First one up is the first time I've dived into this box set, and this is Magic, Myth, and Mutilation, the micro-budget cinema of Michael J. Murphy, 1967 to 2015 from Indicator. This set is insane, right? It might not have a little ding on there, but I'm not reselling. I'm glad to have this set. It has tons of movies on here. The one I am talking about, I'll show you in the video, in the close-up, is Death in the Family from the first disc, 1981. Um, yeah, I didn't even know this movie existed really. So like I, I probably explained when I bought this set, the only time I've seen a Michael J. Murphy movie, I've seen a couple of his movies on DVD I had and never watched them, was the first time I saw one was for 85. It was Bloodstream. Watched this crummy copy on YouTube or something. It was awful, unwatchable, terribly boring movie. So I'm going to be honest with you. I was like, I don't know. I don't know when that set came out. I was like, I don't know. That whole collection like that. So it, tempting too, because maybe I can give this director or see everything together. is kind of just like 
interesting. You can give them a fair shake and at the very least kind of understand cinema in a certain low budget cinema in a certain way. Um, so I didn't expect much when I popped in Death in the Family from 1981. I was like, ah, this is going to be crummy crap. It was short. So I put it in and, and right away I was like, this is better, a lot better than I remember Bloodstream being. So what we have here is uh, we have this brother and sister who have a horribly weird incestuous relationship right off the bat. And their father has just, uh, you know, they, they're showing up and the father just got married to this younger woman. And they're talking about it. They're like, yeah, they seem iffy about it. But then the father washes up on shore and he's dead. They find his watch and everything like that. Uh, this ring, his wedding ring or something, his watch and this burned body. And they're like, oh, my God, our father is dead. And they're really sad at first, uh, the fiance, the brother and sister. And then pretty soon they start to kind of question. The brother and sister are like, maybe she did it. And before long, you start to question, maybe somebody else did it. You don't really know who did it. They start to point fingers at each other. Some people end up dead. You know, some people that shouldn't end up dead. And there's a bunch of reveals and everything like that. Now you're like, that doesn't sound like a horror. That sounds more like a thriller. But by the time people start getting killed, it kind of bends into that horror movie. It has a lot of kind of weird, kind of, I guess you'd say modern gothic with the weird incestuous stuff and the inheritance and all that kind of deal like that. So I think it does qualify as a horror film. I mean, much more than a lot of the movies that they told me were horror films that I've watched, like Early Warning and all that kind of stuff. Jeez, man. So many movies, not horror movies, listed as horror movies from 81 now um, but this one I, I enjoyed it it's pretty well made it's pretty pretty gritty I guess you'd say it's low budget but it, it does it suffices it's got a dark ending um, reminds me of the mechanic believe it or not right oh the mechanic was 70s yeah so much before this and this is pretty good pretty well made low budget cinema looks good sounds good for what it is enjoyable don't have that much to say about it but uh, my first my, I guess my second uh, trip with Michael J. Murphy is a pleasant one. And I look forward to watching the rest of this set as the 80s continue. Because he's got a bunch of horror movies that I'm going to watch for 81, 82 and 83 and all that kind of stuff. though. So really cool. Uh, I'm glad to have this set. I, I always try to get these big monster sets because it's a, definitely a piece of history to see a, a, a director's entire filmography. I remember going through the Andy Milligan set when I did 1970. Guy had four movies from 1970. That's just awesome. But yeah, uh, Death in the Family. We're checking out for sure. Okay, the next one from 1981 is The Killing of Angel Street. Um, this is an Australian TV film. And uh, this listed as horror is a stretch. I will admit that it does have a lot of dark elements, but it's more of a thriller. But it does have some creepy stuff. So essentially what we have here is this woman returns home from Australia and she realized, I mean, to her small town in Australia. And uh, her father has been fighting with this kind of big conglomerate like corporation that has been knocking all the houses down on Angel Street for waterfront property. Kind of bold, just doing a lot of crummy, really dirty things, offering low prices, doing all sorts of shitty things to that. And she, she doesn't want to go, she doesn't really feel like her father is fighting, right? whatever. She doesn't think it's worth it. But uh, essentially her father ends up murdered under very foggy circumstances in a fire. So she obviously wants to stand up against it. And there's kind of this like uh, communist guy who wants to stand up and help her and all these kind of things, starts pushing her in that direction. And people start to threaten her, her brother, her family, all this kind of stuff like that, right? And before long, it gets really dark where she's like kidnapped and all these kind of things and threatened. But I would never say it goes into a full horror movie at all. It's like, and, 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 and that is a stretch. Now, I'm not trying to complain about that because obviously I watched some other thrillers, but the idea that half the thrillers I watched are more horror than this, and this is listed as a horror is nonsense. Um, it's an all right movie. It's well acted. It's well done. It's based on a true story, if I'm not mistaken, and it has a lot to say. And, and you know, it, 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 there's a great line in the trailer that says, you don't have to, uh, it tells you your whole life that you should fear fear like not fear the police or something but these are the things you have to be fe afraid from who will protect you from them all this kind of stuff like that um that, that's really kind of interesting stuff but yeah there's some cd characters um and at the very end you know like like the, the one climax i guess could be considered horror but it never really full goes full goes that way i don't have much to say about it to be honest there's not really much to say except that it's a well-made thriller that kind of has a message uh, the acting is solid the characters are decent there's a couple actually really kind of depressing realistic murders in it that I think kind of do that too like but it feels more like a political thriller than anything else to be honest I don't think it ever crosses that line uh, dark enough or horror enough to be a horror film but if it sounds like it's up your alley The Killing of Angel Street it's worth watching I think it's an interesting enough movie and uh, it, it looks good too I mean for like seeing the street and all that kind of stuff and and uh, especially you know I, I had the idea of this kind of uh, gentr gentrification everything like that right these big corporations buying up and trashing things 
it's uh, it's been happening forever. It will continue to happen, right? Forever. It's just unfortunately the way it is. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, now everybody's like, don't say relevant because it's like saying it's relevant now. It's, I mean, it's just things never change, right? But uh, yeah, the killing of Angel Street. Good, good. If it sounds like it's up your alley, check it out. Uh, and the last 1981 movie is from Indonesia, and this is The Magic Man. Now, this one wasn't originally on my list because on Internet Movie Database, it's listed as fantasy, um, not horror at all. And I, I don't understand why this one's not listed as horror, probably because no one saw it. But it is on Letterboxd uh, recently, and it popped up on places to watch. So I was like, oh, so The Magic Man, that's a movie, and it is 81. And that's the problem with trying to do every movie from the year that you can because new movies pop up constantly. And it is definitely a horror film, more so than a lot of the ones I've been watching recently. So this is about an hour and 45 minutes, a little long for an Indonesian horror film. It kind of feels like there's two subplots going here. So what we have here is we have this kind of cave where like this ogre lives in there and he kind of goes out at night and he attacks villagers and kills them. In the very beginning, he kills a bunch of people breaking down walls and he's not really like supposed to do that, right? So there's like this old like man that guards the cave who's like, you shouldn't kill people that live in the village, yada, yada, yada. Um, and meanwhile, we have this really uh, deformed man who has a good heart. And there's this girl in the very beginning that almost drowns in the river and he pulls her out. And the town people find him and they're like, get out of here, you piece of shit, you ugly monster. You shouldn't have touched her. What'd you do to her? We want you gone. You're too ugly to be here. And he's really upset about it. And he goes to this cave and this old man promises him, I can make you a handsome man. But you must do these things for me, yada, yada, and never do, you know, you kill anyone in the village. Yeah, all those kind of stuff like that. So he makes him this handsome man. And he kind of starts this relationship with this woman, but he kind of goes out for revenge. And when he goes out for revenge, I think he pisses off this guy in the cave. And this kind of curses him to at night at sometimes turn into this bat creature, right? So somebody's, I think Letterboxd Review is like literal bat shit movie. It's like, yeah, so he's a Batman. He's like a bat werewolf, right? And he goes out and he turns into his bat and he must attack. He must kill. And he starts to focus on a lot of the people that did him wrong. Of course, when he's in love with this woman, it kind of makes things complicated, right? So he has this feud with this other family that's related to this girl, all sorts of things like that. And he's constantly turning more vicious, more monster-like. But she starts to love him and she starts to turn evil as well, get the taste of that bat thing or whatever the fuck it is. But like you think that's enough for a movie. That's an hour and a half movie right there. No, 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 no. They're going to hire a shaman and there's going to be this shaman shaman guy that comes in which seems like every indonesian movie we're like no you gotta bring in a shaman queen of black magic you gotta bring in a shaman the warrior we need another shaman to fight this monster like so there's always this subplot of all these indonesian movies we're like that's right they got me goes to the hole probably i think has one too it's like hey i'm a shaman i'm coming in to take on this monster even what was the one i just watched the hut like that's a that's a south korean and it's like we gotta get a shaman in this fucking movie uh every asian movie's like eh, is there a shaman in this i don't know you better bring a shaman in here so like like basically what happens is they bring in this guy and he's like i gotta take you out so he brings all these zombies up from the grave so this bat creature's fighting zombies or something like that and he's taking them out and it's like 15 20 minute subplot of this and i'm like i'm not complaining but this is definitely what's padding this movie to make it an hour and like 45 minutes but but regardless we ended a tragic kind of long chainy wolfman kind of thing here at the very end solid solid horror movie enjoyable another indonesian one if i'm not mistaken is it thailand or indonesia but regardless you know um, I've enjoyed most of the Indonesian horror films from 81. Uh, it's kind of a country that I did expect too much, and they've been pretty heavy, pretty, pretty, pretty solid uh, coming through. Uh, you know, uh, some of the Taiwanese ones are hard because I'm not finding a lot of subtitles and everything, and South Korean too. But there's a lot. I, I'm going to have to go over ones I couldn't, I couldn't do AI subtitles for and ones that are lost films. I just kind of run those down for 81. I should have done it for 82 from 1980. When I did it, when I'm looking at it now and I'm like, oh shit, man, there's there's movies that I missed from 1980 that I should have watched, like ones that are listed as 81 that are actually 80, like uh, T-O-Y-O-L, like Tayol, which is about a giant killer baby thing. I'm like, fuck, I should have watched that for 80. I doubt it made my top 25, but it's a fucking giant killer baby thing. It's still worth watching. Uh, but anyways, uh, The Magic Man, check it out. Kind of reminds me of what's that Philippines movie, like the Twilight People. There's that bat guy flying around. I mean, this this is better than Twilight People. I'll go as far to say that. It is. How many bat monster man, Batman movies are there? Not including Batman, like actual beast man bat things. And not including man bat from Batman either. But uh, I don't know. There's a handful of them for sure. But anyways, the magic man. Check it out if it sounds like it's up your alley. Kind of not going to lie, guys. I'm getting a little winded with the COVID. But uh, here we go is the Patreon pick. And I think this is a... Is this a Jim Simon, 
I can't remember. He picked The Killing from 1956, Stanley Kubrick. I never saw it. I know, right? So I put this fan and I was like, okay, it's got Sterling Hayding. Love Sterling Hayding. I just recently rewatched Venom with him and he's great in it. He's great in everything. I mean, I, I like the guy in everything from Dr. Strange, Love of the Godfather to Terra uh, uh, Texas Town. He's always good. Always good stuff. So, so I put this in and I'm watching Sterling Hayding and it's, it's like a very fast paced heist movie. I've never seen a short Stanley Kubrick movie. A low budget one, short, like 90 minutes, 85 minutes. And it's like showing this simple heist, not a simple, but a, a complicated heist, basically from all these different points of view and all these different characters. So we learn everybody. And Sterling Hayden's got the, the best voice. He's got the best voice I can imagine. You know, I just love his voice. I love his demeanor. He's a, he's a recently released sex con. He has a love of his life and he wants to make life easy for her and him. And they want to split. They want to get a bunch of money and get the hell out of there. They got a way to, to rob this racetrack. And he sets up all these things. He's got five guys in on it. He's got a couple guys that are doing small things here. You got Tim Leary in here. Uh, uh, amazing performance. You got Elijah uh, Wood a lot Jr. Uh, in here. Uh, just from last week's Messiah of Evil. Another perfect performance for him. That nervous kind of energy right just perfect here i always mix it up is elijah cook jr elijah wood jr i always mix it up it's elijah cook jr i think but anyways great character actor so anyways what we have here is you just know everything that's going to go wrong because they set up who all these characters are and they build it up and you see it from all these different points of views so when you watch it you can't help but think yeah every director in the world stole from this guy like yeah, tarantino jackie brown like it's not his script but you know i think it's a roger avery script i don't remember but it's based off another person's book regardless it does not it feels like that Kubrick idea, right? Where you're watching this movie. And and there's something about 50s movies I love. 56 especially, right? You got Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It's fucking like 75 minutes. It gets all the points across that the 78 version gets, that the 90s version gets in 85 minutes. It's brisk. It works. It's scary. Everything is done as well, if not better, than the later versions. And I feel that same way about this one. I'm like, it's fast. It's right to the point. Everything works perfect. The tension is great. They don't have to over-explain anything. I, I love this movie. This is a great movie. And when the, the violence and the action happens, it's very matter-of-fact, very sudden, and very, oh, wow. Not drawn out. Just, boom, done. And I remember thinking, that's it? That's what happened? Oh, shit. And it's kind of like that. It just only takes a matter of seconds. And, uh, yeah. It only takes one fuck up too to screw up a plan. That's why when you got more cogs in there, there's always going to be something that screws up. One of them's going to screw up, and a couple of them screw up here. Uh, but but regardless, you know, uh, it's just excellent. And at the very end, the last line that Sterling Hayding has is perfect. What for? You know, like why is it whatever? You know, he basically just there's no reason reason for it. But uh, really intense on the edge of your seat well shot, different points of view. The script is really, and the pacing, the script and pacing and acting is really what pushes this one. It's just so clever, so quick. I, I love this thing, man. It's great stuff. I recommend anybody watch this. Everybody should watch this, especially if you're making movies, man. Cut your shit. You don't need a three hour movie. I don't need a 45 minute backstory. I know who this guy is just because he's a good actor and his demeanor. You know, you know, if you got a good character actor, you don't need a 45-minute backstory. You know who they are right away. You know? But anyways, this is excellent stuff. Bring back the 90-minute movie, please. I know people are like, yeah, I can play. God, I'm not watching it anymore. I know, it's shitty. I'll watch a lot of longer movies sometimes. But a long movie should be a special occasion movie. If I put in a, uh, a three-hour movie and it's mediocre as balls, I'm going to come down three times as hard on that movie. I'm sorry. I know that's not fair, but I am. If your movie's over two hours and it's mediocre, it's going to be a fucking two instead of a three. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I'm sorry. This movie, it's great. And it's only fucking eight, like 80 minutes. It's fucking amazing. But anyways, The Killing, excellent stuff. Uh, I love Sterling Hating. I think that this guy is, a, you know, I want to watch a lot more with him in it. You know, I've seen a handful and loved everything he's done. And uh, like I said, all the character actors in here are excellent too, even the ones I didn't recognize. And Tim Leary is a guy that a lot of people love. And I, I didn't know that well. Um, this one, I just thought he was so, such a weird demeanor. Like nobody's like that guy. He's the only guy out there doing what he's doing and being like that. Fucking creepy and just excellent and just perfect. Great movie. Loved it. All right, everybody. Let's get these questions, comments, concerns, all that stuff. 
Ken Coakley, I saw Barbarella in an all-night movie marathon in Boston in 1989 with the documentary comic book Confidential. Daffy Duck's Quackbusters, Ralph Bansky's Hey Good Looking, and anime called Twilight of the Cockroaches, and I'm Madman. It was a star-studded cast with Jane Fonda coming off a of barefoot in the park and Cat Blue. The casting was controversial because Fonda was married to Roger Vadim at the time. John Philip Law was great casting as the blind angel Pickar. He wasn't very charismatic. Uh, charismatic. Um, sorry, I've trouble with words today, but he had a very heroic masculine face, which made him perfect for Danger Diabolique, The Love Machine, and Attack Force Z. David Hebbings from Deep Red and Blow Up had the best character name, Dildano. Milo O'Shea, who played Duran Duran, was also in Romeo and Juliet, as well as The Theater of Blood. Antonio, uh, Anita Pallenberg, who played The Great Tyrant, was also in a performance with Mick Jagger. She also dated Brian Jones and Keith Richards and Jimi Hendrix. She really got around. You mentioned Fu Shang in one of your reviews. I'm a huge fan of his. A friend of mine from Hong Kong got me a documentary about his life. He was killed in a car accident while he was still making Eight Diagram Pole Fighter. He was supposed to star in it, but they changed the script. Gordon Liu, who did the star, was supposed to be killed off early in the film. Something similar happened with Bruce Lee. He was supposed to be killed off early in The Big Boss, and James Ten was supposed to star. Director Liu Wang, like Lian, made him the star. My favorite Fu Shang film was The Five Masters of Shawin. Getting back to Jane Fonda, I watched a movie that she made in 1978 called California Suit. She starred with Alan Alda, and as I was watching the movie, I thought Alan Alda looked like someone else. Then it came to me, he looked like you. Not too different. Um, I don't, uh, I I kid D3240. Messiah of Evil is one of my favorite 70s horror films. Very unique, weird, and creepy. Agreed. Duggar Sr., loving your VHS collection. Glorious stuff. Thank you. Nicole Tyrant. Um, and wow, your 81 intro compilation is awesome. Thank you. And she says, Barbarella, one of my fave movies, uh, films, but great even so. My favorite weird films are great even so. Nick Mua, Messiah of Evil looks promising indeed. I will acquire it if I can afford it. You should charge money for all these golden movie tips. Um, I hope you received good health news, health-wise. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you. Also, I very much enjoyed your latest Horror 1981 uh, episode featuring Mr. Joe Rubin. I can't wait to see what you scare up next and who your guest will be. I'm recording two tomorrow on Saturday. So, I have Possession with Duncan McLeish and My Bloody Valentine with my uh, some of my friends over at the 22 Shots of Moods of Horror podcast. Questions. Do you plan on watching A Suitable Flesh featuring Barbara Crampton? I really enjoyed it. I do. Directed by Joe Lynch, who I like. When was the last time a horror movie actually scared you? For me, it was close to 20, year ago, 20 years ago when I discovered J-Horror. Scared me. It depends. I mean, there's stuff that made me think or jump. I can't think right now off the top of my head. Um, how long does it take you to produce, make a horror 1981 episode? It depends. You know, it, it all depends, really. Till next time, cheers. Art Figurito, Dave, not sure how many years I have made you a weekly ritual. Probably a few, at any rate. And now you have been at this quite some time, but I've seen you get even better at your craft over the span during which I have been watching. Thank you for your dedication. I appreciate it. I try. Sometimes I take a few steps back, but I like to think I'm getting a little better. Uh, Collectivist. While Flanagan's House of Usher isn't perfect, it's great how all the main post stories were incorporated. I like that. Fetish Magic. Oh, I got Messiah of Evil, but I haven't watched it yet. Still longing for Mr. Parker's Holt. Not gonna fucking happen. Yeah. So uh, we're just gonna do the update right here. Let me see what I got here. It's only one title. Um, I did order some stuff for Black Friday. Um, quite a bit, actually, but it's not all gonna show up together and uh, whatnot. But the one thing that did show up, I'm sitting here like, um, is The Mist 4K. It's been a while since I watched The Mist. I always remember really liking this when it came out, but uh, definitely going to revisit it in 4K. Uh, this is the black and white version in 4K too, which makes me happy. I don't think I ever had that Blu-ray. Maybe I did. I don't know. But it was really cheap. 11 bucks, slipcover and everything. Sometimes catalog titles are definitely worth the 12 bucks for 4K. Maybe I'll watch it tonight if I feel up to it, if I have time. But anyways, great stuff. The Mist. Anyways, we're out of here. All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm.